All right, welcome back. We're in macro unit six, and we're now approaching the beginning of the end of the semester. Um, in this unit, we're going to learn about something called long run aggregate supply. And usually in these units, the first screencasts aren't as important as the latter ones. The latter ones kind of tie, the, tie everything together. Here, uh, the first screencast is actually maybe the most important one because it's going to form the foundation for everything that comes afterwards. So the unit is entitled Conflicting Schools of Thought and Economic Growth. We're going to learn about some of the implications of what you've been learning about this semester, and we're going to get exposed to some of the disagreements and fights that economists have between one another. And fighting economists is never a pretty thing, because when economists fight, it kind of looks like this. Eh, eh, stop, stop, eh, eh. So uh, let's get started. All right, so, so far we've been talking about the economy, and implicitly we've been talking about it in what's called the short run. Um, I haven't really made that distinction so thus far because I haven't really even told you that something called the long run exists. Um, but in this unit, we're going to look at some of the long run implications of um, the stuff that you've been learning, the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, and fiscal and monetary policy. And again, along the way, we're going to learn about some of the disagreements that uh, economists have about this model and learn about some different economic schools of thought. Before we get started today, though, we've got to do a little bit of review uh, specifically about the difference between um, what is called nominal and what is called real. Um, we have to review this so you understand long run aggregate supply. So we've seen this before, this distinction between nominal and real, and um, specifically we saw it in the distinction between nominal GDP and real GDP. Remember, nominal was just a number, and real was a number adjusted for price changes. So nominal GDP was kind of a meaningless number. Real GDP is uh, the amount of goods and services produced in real terms adjusted for the fact that prices change. So there was a formula that we used to convert real, uh, I'm sorry, nominal GDP to real GDP. And I want you to keep that distinction in mind, the difference between nominal and real. And specifically in this unit, we need to make a distinction between nominal wages and real wages. So a nominal wage is the amount printed on your paycheck. If you go to work and make a thousand bucks a week, if that's what your paycheck says, that's your nominal wage. Your real wage is the amount of stuff that you could actually buy with your paycheck. It's the amount of goods and services that can be purchased with your nominal wage. In other words, just like with GDP, it's your nominal wage adjusted for price level changes, adjusted for inflation. So I'll take you through a kind of simple example to show you the difference between the two. Let's say you earn $1,000 a week at your job, and to keep things simple, let's say the economy produces only one thing, cowboy hats, which cost $50 each. Now let's assume that this year is the base year, so we'll assign it a price index of 100. That should sound familiar to you. Again, your nominal wage is $1,000. If I wanted to use that nominal into real formula to convert that to a real wage, I would take your nominal wage adjusted by the, uh, divided by the price index, which is 100, times 100, and I get 1,000. Since this is the base year, your real wage is your nominal wage. So back to those cowboy hats, <clears throat> excuse me, if they cost $50 each and you have $1,000, your nominal paycheck of $1,000 could theoretically buy 20 cowboy hats. All right, now let's assume that the price of cowboy hats rises to $100 each. We can say that the price index would now be 200, since cowboy hats are the only things being produced, and since they doubled in price, we have a twice as high a price index. Your nominal wage hasn't changed, it's still $1,000, but in your real wage has changed. Even though the number on your paycheck hasn't changed, the amount of goods and services you can buy has. has. So again, using the formula to convert nominal to real, 1,000 is your nominal paycheck divided by the price index, which is 200, times 100 equals $500. In other words, if prices double, your effective paycheck has been cut in half. The amount of goods and services it can buy has been cut in half. And you can see that when you go back to those cowboy hats. <coughs> Excuse me. You still have $1,000, but now if cowboy hats cost $200, you can only buy 10 of them. You could have bought twice as many before. All right, so that's the difference between nominal and real. Nominal is, again, just what your paycheck says. Your real wage is what you could actually buy with your paycheck. 
So now we can make a distinction between the short run and the long run. <clears throat> the definition of the short run in macroeconomics is the time period in which nominal resource prices, and there's the word nominal, like wages, haven't had time to adjust to price level changes. Resource prices are the prices for resources, things like land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial ability. So we're going to use labor and wages as our example of a resource throughout this unit, but realize that there are other resources out there. And in the short run, the idea is that nominal um, wages and other resource prices don't have time to adjust to price changes. The reason that um, workers might not get their wages adjusted when prices change, like when, price, when cowboy hat prices go up, is that first off, workers might be unaware that prices are changing and inflation can happen relatively slowly. Um, secondly, workers often worked on fixed wage contracts. They get paid a certain amount for a certain amount of years and their wages simply can't change until their contracts are over. And then finally, there are all sorts of laws out there that limit what can happen to wages like minimum wage laws. So even if prices come way way down and businesses aren't earning as much money, they might not be able to change how much they pay their workers for all these reasons. If that's what the short run is, then we're going to define the long run as the time period in which nominal resource prices like wages are fully able to adjust to price level changes. In other words, if you see that the price of cowboy hats are going up and then eventually you go to your boss and say, hey, the prices of things are going up, you got to pay me more. Once your boss starts to pay you more, we're now in the long run. Your nominal wage has adjusted because of prices changing in the economy. <clears throat> All right, so with those two definitions behind us, I'm about to tell you two long run stories. And this is really the heart of the unit. It's really important that you understand these stories and are able to replicate these stories both verbally and graphically. So the stories are pretty simple and the extent to which you believe these stories are going to inform what kind of economist you are, whether you're a free market economist or whether you're one who believes in the need for government intervention. But we'll get to that in later screencasts. All right, so the two stories I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna call the below full employment story and the above full employment story. And the moral of these stories, and really the key to this whole unit, is that in the long run, we're always going to go back to full employment. In other words, in the long run, we're always going to be at that roughly 5% unemployment level, where we have structural and frictional unemployment, but no cyclical unemployment. And these stories are an explanation as to why that happens. All right, so let's go back to our aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph. You'll remember there's aggregate demand and there's aggregate supply. And you'll remember that there's a magical place that we want them to cross, which is at full employment, that blue vertical line. In this graph, we have a perfect economy, an economy that's at full employment GDP. We're going to focus here in the circled section on this graph, because again, this is where the economy is most of the time. We're very rarely on the horizontal portion or in the vertical portion of the aggregate supply curve. And we're going to make one more distinction here. We're going to now call this aggregate supply curve short run or SR aggregate supply to distinguish it from long run aggregate supply. All right, so zooming in on that little circled portion there, um, here's what we were looking at. An economy that's at full employment, we're at point A, where aggregate demand crosses short-run aggregate supply. So to start the below full employment story, let's say something happens to bring us below full employment. Maybe aggregate demand shifts to the left. Maybe businesses stop spending money, the government stops spending money, maybe consumers stop spending money, and we get an AD shift from AD1 to AD2. We move from point A to point B. Now, the, the important thing to notice about point B is that it's below full employment. We're no longer at full employment. And I want you to picture what this would look like in the economy. If you're an employer and you're thinking about hiring, when you look out your window, what you're seeing are lots and lots of unemployed resources, lots and lots of workers without jobs. There's also lots of uh, other unused resources, lots of unused steel, lots of unused oil, all sorts of unused resources. We're not at our full potential for the economy. Well, the idea here is that this is going to have a downward pressure on nominal wages. If there's lots and lots of unemployment, 
bosses are going to say to their employees, hey, look, you know, I'm paying you 10 bucks an hour, but there's all those people out there that are desperate for jobs that would be willing to work for eight bucks an hour. I need you to pay, take a pay cut. And maybe if you don't pay, take a pay cut, I'll fire you and hire one of those people that's desperate for a job. <clears throat> so the, the first part of the story is really the idea that nominal wages are going to start to fall. Workers are going to get paid less because there's so many uh, available workers out there. Now the key to this, both of these, uh, both the below and the above full employment stories, is what automatically happens to the short run aggregate supply. Because go back to what you know about aggregate supply and what moves that curve. If, we, if employers can all of a sudden start paying their workers less, it becomes easier and cheaper to produce. Your workers aren't costing quite as much. And we know what happens to the aggregate supply when it becomes easier or cheaper to produce. The aggregate supply curve shifts to the right. So the idea here is that without any kind of government intervention, once those nominal wages start to fall and it's cheaper to produce, short-run aggregate supply is going to shift to the right, moving from SRAS1 to SRAS2. We're going to move from the short run at point B back to full employment. We're going to wind up at point C. Now notice we started at A, we took a little short run trip to point B, but in the end we wound up at point C, back in full employment. So that's what it looks like graphically. If you had to explain it in words, it would look something like this. If we're below full employment, there are lots of unused resources, like workers without jobs. That's going to create a downward pressure on resource prices, including wages, nominal wages. Nominal wages will start to fall. And now that it's easier and cheaper to produce, short-run aggregate supply shifts to the right, and we get back to full employment. All right, so now let me tell you the opposite story, what I'm going to call the above full employment story, which is going to look very similar, but just kind of in reverse. Again, let's say we're starting at full employment at point A, and something happens to move us away from full employment. Government starts spending more money, or maybe businesses start spending more money. Aggregate demand shifts to the right from 81 to 82. And in the short run, we move from point A to point B. Now think about what it means to be at point B. We're beyond full employment. <clears throat> at full employment, everyone who wants a job already has a job. So now we're past that point. We're pushing our workers into overtime. We're pulling people out of the into the labor force who didn't even want to be into the labor force. The idea here is that this is going to pr produce an upward pressure on nominal wages. If I need to produce more and move from point A to point B, and I need more workers to do that, I can't just easily find those workers. There aren't thousands of them milling around outside desperate for jobs. In fact, everyone who wants a job already has a job. So if I want to produce more and get myself more employees, I'm going to have to call people who already have jobs and say to them, hey, you're making 10 bucks an hour, I'll pay you 12 bucks an hour to come work for me. Or I'll have to call stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home dads, people who aren't in the labor force, and say, hey, I know that you don't want to work at the going wage of 10 bucks an hour, come work for me, I'll pay you 15 bucks an hour. If we're at above full employment, there's an upward pressure on resource prices like wages. Well, again, relate that to short-run aggregate supply. If you have to start paying your workers more and paying more for other kinds of resources, it becomes harder or more expensive to produce things. And that's going to have an effect on short-run aggregate supply. It's going to wind up shifting it to the left. We're going to move in the long run from SRAS1 to SRAS2, from point B to point C. And notice we wind up back at full employment. We started at A, we took a short run trip to B, and we wind up back at point C. All right, so again, in words, the above full employment story looks something like this. If we're at above full employment, resources like workers are in very short supply. That creates an upward pressure on resource prices, including wages. Nominal wages and other resource prices will begin to rise. Those rising resource prices means that it's now more expensive to produce stuff and aggregate supply in the short run is going to shift to the left and we're going to wind up back at full employment. So the moral of the story here is that we always wind up back at full employment. 
In the last example, again, we jump from A to B to C. In the long run, if we're winding up back on this blue vertical line, if we're winding up back on this full employment GDP line, we can just simply wind up calling that long run aggregate supply. In the long run, this is how much stuff people are going to produce. This is going to be the level of employment and how much stuff gets produced by that level of employment. Now this is a kind of a controversial story, both the above and the, full, and the below stories. And again, the extent to which you believe them is kind of going to inform what you think about all the other screencasts that are coming. Anyway, that is the heart of this unit, and it's really important for you to understand this uh, story of how we get back to this blue vertical line. So in the end, long run equilibrium is gonna happen where aggregate demand crosses short run aggregate supply at full employment. The picture that you see in front of you is what we're going to call long-run equilibrium in this aggregate demand aggregate supply model. Okay, that is it for this first screencast. I will see you for the second. That's not fair that I failed the test. You said that I got question one wrong. You did. The Bolshevik revolution did not result in democracy in Russia. But a friend told me that D would be the answer. I am aware that you were trying to cheat. That is why I changed the answers before you took the test. That's not fair.